<laughs> you made it as well. Do you need my help? Wherever you want. If you want to stay here, if I forgot to talk about something, you can talk about something. Um. You're not going to be able to understand my handwriting. No, it's <laughs> about the same as mine. I'll just t say the end. Huh? I'll just say the end about the tickets. And they're, they're on sale all this week, and today's the last day to yeah, yeah. buy before it goes out. Today or tomorrow? I think it ends at midnight tonight. Oh, okay, okay. Because I look on my it says Tuesday, but maybe Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday at 12 a.m. Okay. Hello. Hi, everybody. Just a quick reminder. Uh, just this Friday, February 26, we will be hosting the LABA conference, Latin America conference. And we will be hosting it together with Columbia Business School. It's the first time that we are doing it together. It's a really nice conference. It's going to be from 8.30 AM to 3.45 PM, ending with a cocktail. <clears throat> with a cocktail. We will be hosting four different panels, one about real estate, another one about private equity and venture capital, one about finance and macroeconomics, and another one about general management. Uh, it's a really nice conference. The price right now is $25. That's today's the last day to buy for $25. Tomorrow good it's... Sorry? <laughs> it's a good price. After today, it's going to be $30 if you buy it tomorrow. Just to give you an example of people that will be in the conference, for example, the finance conference will be the panel, the panel for finance we will be hosting with the principal of KKR for macroeconomic asset allocation, the head of emerging markets for Citi, and the chief equity strategist for, for Latin America from Morgan Stanley. So for more information, just go to nyclabaconference.com. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. What's the question? Yeah, it'll be in English. <laughs> that was my question. Um, I'm almost fluent. A couple more days. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, I'm going to do my usual two questions. You know what's coming, right? Everybody's in a group, right? Okay. Who doesn't have a company yet? Everybody but you has a company? Eh? I don't think so. I, I think there are at least 20% here who still not picked a company. That's just my cynical side speaking. So if you haven't, even if you haven't let me know, pick one soon. Eh? Because this week we start on the mechanics of hurdle rates. We already started with risk-free rates on Wednesday. Today we're going to complete that discussion, risk-free rates. By the end of today, no matter what currency I come to you and give you, you should be able to give me a risk-free rate in that currency. Russian rubles, Venezuelan bolivar, maybe not. Um, Zimbabwean dollar. But we're going to lay the foundations for risk free rates. And you're going to see it's not that simple. It's not as easy as it used to be when we lived in a dollarized world where everything you had to think about was USD bond rates. And then we're going to move on to equity risk premiums. I'm going to lay the foundation again by talking about what we're trying to estimate and then we, how we try to do it with all the flaws with each approach. So let me go back and very quickly review where we were with risk free rates. We started easy, right? To get a risk-free rate in corporate finance, we said we need a default-free long-term rate. That's it, default-free and long-term. So we started with the US dollars, and we used the US T-bond rate as our risk-free rate, and then we got down our knees and hoped and prayed that there's no default risk in the US Treasury. That's the implicit assumption we're making. So right now, the risk-free rate in US dollars, risk-free rates don't go with countries, they go with currencies. So from this point on, 
Don't think of a country with a risk-free rate, think of a currency. And you're going to see that very quickly when we talk about the euro and the European zone. So the risk-free rate in US dollars right now is perhaps 1.7, 1.75, 1.8%, somewhere over there. Then we moved on to the euro. Slightly more difficult task, right? Why? Because there are a dozen governments all issuing 10-year bonds in euros, and the rates are all different. And we decided that because we wanted something default-free and long-term, that we were going to latch on to one of those 12 rates. Which one? OK. Remember, we use the German not because it's German, but because it is the lowest of the 12 rates. The reason I wanted to separate German from the lowest was, who knows, five years from now, the lowest euro rate might be the Portuguese 10-year bond rate. Miracles can happen. But you've got to leave it open. So the German rate, and even the German rate has a little bit of a problem. The minute the European zone adopted the euro as a currency, what did central banks lose in each, each country? The power to print currency, which is technically why the US Treasury is default free. It's not because it's some incredibly well-run institution. It's not. But because they have a printing press that they can run. So you could argue that even the German euro bond rate has a semblance of default risk. So there are some people who actually suggest we should go to the European Central Bank. There's an ECB 10-year bond which you can get, which right now is almost at the same rate as the German rate, so the, government, the, the market doesn't see a difference. But maybe if you don't like to use any of those countries, you'd go with that rate. And that rate right now is perhaps 0 0.7, 0 0.75%. So you've got a risk-free rate in euros. So if I come to you with any currency where there's an issuing entity which is viewed as default free, and we've used the US and Germany as our examples, I can use a government bond rate in that currency, and I've got my risk free rate. So I'm going to start easy. This is a page of countries which were AAA rated in November of 2013. So the governments were AAA rated. I've taken the government bond rate, and you can see the risk free rate in November of 2013 varied from half a percent for Japanese yen to more, almost 4% for the Australian dollar. All risk free rates, but in different currencies. Now, if you're starting to think, why would risk free rates vary across currencies? We're going to com come back and confront that more completely, because clearly, depending on the currency you use, you're going to get a different risk free rate. But this was the easy scenario. I found a government that was AAA rated. I hoped and prayed that Moody's and S&P knew what they were doing. I took the AAA rating as a sign that there was no default risk. I've used the government bond rate as my risk free rate. Now let's make things difficult. What if you're working in a currency where there is no AAA entity issuing bonds in that currency? As an example, I'm going to take, in this case, the Indian government bond rate. Let's suppose I wanted a rupee risk free rate. I could find a 10-year Indian government bond and the rate in November of 2013 on the 10-year rupee denominated. So forget about the dollar, the euro, other currencies. I'm looking for a rupee denominated bond. The rate on that bond was 8.82%. Let me pause right there. You're tempted at this stage to say it's a government bond rate. I'm going to use that as my risk-free rate in rupees. But what's the question I need to ask before I do that? Is the Indian government bond default-free? And we could get into philosophical questions, nationalistic questions. I don't want to go there, so I'm going to cheat. I went to the Moody's website, and I clicked on sovereign ratings. And if you ever visit the website, they list out ratings for every current country that Moody's rates. Those, that's what a sovereign rating, just like they rate corporate bonds, they rate sovereigns. They rate 140 countries as of the end of 2015. In November of 2013, when I went and looked at those ratings, it gave me two ratings for every country. A foreign currency rating and a local currency rating. What's the difference? What is Moody's measuring when it gives you the foreign currency rating for India? What is it telling you? It's, it's not even a variation. What does Moody's measure with the rating? It measures default risk, right? That's all it cares about. It doesn't care about variation, currency variation. It says if India borrowed in US dollars or euros, which it can, this is the default risk we see in the country. I wasn't interested in that rating. Then I went to the local currency rating, and I was hoping and praying what would make life really easy for me. Under what conditions can I use the 8.82% as my risk free rate? Is if the local currency rating were AAA. I hoped and prayed I'd see a AAA. I didn't. What I saw instead was a BAA3, not an awful rating, 
but not quite investment grade. So what is Moody's telling me? Even in the local currency, there is default risk in India. He's saying, why would there ever be default risk if you can run the printing presses faster? You know that 25% of all sovereign defaults in the last 100 years have been in the local currency? Russia, in particular, in the late 90s, defaulted on its local, I'm sorry, in the local currency. So basically, Russia in the late 90s defaulted in its local currency and paid off bonds in the foreign currency, which tells you a little bit about what the Russian government thinks about its own people, but that's a different discussion. You say, why would you ever default in a local currency when you can print? If you print off, let, let's say you run the printing presses really fast and you pay off all the debt. You're not defaulting, but what's, what is, what's going to happen if you've been running the printing presses really fast? You're going to get inflation. You debase your currency. So the, you're between a rock and a hard place. You can either default or debase your currency. You're saying, which one is worse? And at least in these 25% of cases, the government decided that it'd rather default and deal with the consequences than debase the currency. And for those of you from Latin America, you can see why you make that choice. Because if you debase your currency, people stop trusting your currency for a generation. It took 20 years for the Brazilian government to start issuing bonds in nominal rias. This is the Brazilian government issuing long-term bonds to issue bonds in nominal rias because nom nobody would buy long-term bonds in rias. They didn't trust the currency. They had to issue bonds in dollars. So what Moody's is telling me is there's default risk in the Indian government. It's measuring that risk with a BAA3 rating. I've got my algebra problem set up, right? I know what the government bond rate is. It's 8.82%. What am I worried about? That some of that 8.82% is due to default risk. I'd like to get rid of that default risk. If I can somehow tell you how much of that 8.82% is due to default risk, you're home free, right? So let me give you a number. That BAA3 rating in November of 2013 translated into a default spread of roughly 2.25%. I'll give you three ways of getting the default spread on the next page, but let's take that as a given now, that the default spread given that rating is 2.25%. So this is like an SAT problem. The gov Indian government bond rate is 8.82%. There is default risk in the Indian government bond, and based on my estimate, that default risk translates into a 2.25% spread. You know where I'm going to go next? I'm going to subtract the 2.25% from the 8.82%. Do you see why I'm subtracting it? I want to take out the default risk because I want to make it risk-free. I end up with a risk-free rate of 6.57%. Now, just to try it on a different currency, I took the Chinese renminbi. In November of 2013, the 10-year Chinese renminbi government bond rate was 4.3%. The default spread based on China's rating, which was much higher than India's rating, was only 0.8%. You subtract the 0.8% from the 4.3%, you come up with the risk-free rate in Chinese, remember. You give me the nominal RIA, I take the no nominal RIA government bond rate, I subtract out the default spread, I come up with the risk-free rate in that currency. Yeah? The EU, I, I, got, I got an easier way to get there. The question was, for the EU, where there are lots of countries, how do you do this? I could actually do it the long way, which is to take the Greek government bond rate and subtract out the default spread, right? But I don't have to. Why? What's my opt-out clause in the EU that I don't have to go through that process to come up with a risk-free rate in euros? I have a government which is AAA rated, which issues bonds in euros. So why make my life difficult by trying to back into the rate where the, the reason I have to do this for India is there is no AAA rated entity issuing an Indian rupee government bond. So with the euro, you have an easier choice. Go look up the German euro bond rate. I know you want to punish this company for being a Greek company, and you get plenty of chances. Just don't do it in the risk free rate. Let it go. So everybody clear on getting, so to do this, what do I need in a currency? I need a government bond rate that's long term, and I need a measure of the default risk in that government. I can get to about 43 different currencies, I can get to a risk-free rate by doing this. Saying, what if I were doing my analysis in Zimbabwe in dollars, or Venezuela in Bolivar, where there is no long term government bond? I'll make a suggestion, and for the moment, just take it for what it is. If you, you're finding yourself spending hours, days, weeks trying to come up with a risk-free rate in a currency, it's probably not worth doing your analysis in that currency. Switch currencies. 
looks like you're cheating, and in a sense you are. Do the analysis in a different currency. Currency is just a measurement tool. It's not going to make a good company into a bad company, a risky economy into a safe economy. It just means that your measurement has to be entirely in that currency. For 20 years in Brazil, all of equity research was done in US dollars. Why? Because people didn't want to work with RIAs. That was another side cause of currency debasement. Everything used to get, companies used to make capital budgeting analysis in the middle of Brazil, doing everything in US dollars. What were they trying to avoid? They were trying to avoid the instability that came from the local currency. The problem is, this is like trying to hide an elephant in your living room. You can put a big blanket over it, so I don't see an elephant, but every time it moves, you will notice. So if you do everything in dollars in the middle of Brazil and the RIA is doing all kinds of weird stuff underneath, guess what? It's going to be in your analysis whether you like it or not. You can't dollarize your way to a safe project. But people do it because they don't want to confront the local currency. Yeah? How do you figure the evaluation and having a percent inflation? They put 100% devaluation each year. Right? So if you have a currency with 100% inflation rate, guess what's going to happen each year? It's going to have in value. So in a sense, it's going to drop off. The, you're going to be adding zeros to your exchange rates. It is what it is. You can't change that. I mean, you're going to be helped and hurt by that inflation rate. You're going to be hurt by the fact that your discount rate is going to be huge. You're going to be helped by the fact that when you do your cash flows, your cash flows are going to be huge. Just remember, your columns in Excel will get wider and wider and wider as you go further and further out, simply because of the zeros you're adding on. Okay? But it, so that's why, in fact, we have high inflation currency. Sometimes it's better just for convenience, switch to a lower inflation currency. So that's your second choice, is pick a different currency and do your analysis in that currency. There's a third choice. You know what doing analyses in real terms means? So if I give you a project or evaluation, they do it all in real terms. What am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to take inflation out of your analysis. In other words, the only way you can grow in a real project is by selling more units. You can't count on pushing up prices because inflation is taken out of the process. If you do your cash flows in real terms, they're going to have a lower growth rate than if you do them in nominal terms because you don't get that inflation jump. And if you do your cash flows in real terms, your discount rate has to be in real terms as well. There's a consistency argument which means your risk-free rate has to be a real risk-free rate. It's mind-boggling, right? So what's, I, there's actually a number you can use as a real risk-free rate right now. And you can get it every day out of the Wall Street Journal. What am I talking about? I want a real risk-free rate, not a nominal risk-free rate. What can I use? If you heard of the TIPS, it's an inflation index treasury bond. And here's how it works. Right now, the TIPS rate is 0.75%. It's a 10-year bond. You say 0.75%, why would I invest in it when I can make 1.75% on a regular T bond? On a TIPS bond, you get 0.75% plus whatever the inflation is that year. So ne next year, let's assume there's no inflation. You get 0.75%. Year after, you have 3% inflation. You get 3.75%. So what you're guaranteed is that 0.75% rate no matter what happens. That's a real risk free rate. If you're doing everything in real terms, that would be a risk-free rate. So those are your three choices. Try to fit. My first preference is to try to do things in the local currency because it seems more honest and more transparent and closer to reality to do everything in the local currency. If that doesn't work, I'll try a different currency. If people don't like me going to different currency, I'll go to real terms. But I reserve the option of moving across those because I need to be able to. Any questions? So here are the ways I can get that 2.25% now that I got as my default spread becomes a critical number. Where do I get that number? I'll give you three ways of getting default spreads for countries. And this is going to be something I'm going to use not just to get a risk-free rate, but and late, I'm going to also use it to come up with an equity risk premium. So as I go through these, think about what I'm trying to do. So let's assume that I'm looking at Brazil, and I say, what is the default spread for Brazil? Here's the first way I can get a default spread. I can find a dollar-denominated bond issued by the Brazilian government. And the Brazilian government does issue 10-year dollar-denominated bonds. In November of 2013, the 10-year dollar-denominated Brazilian bond had a rate of 4.25%. So this is a dollar-denominated bond issued by Brazil. The rate is 4.25%. 
I know what the risk free rate in US dollars is because I have the T-bond right next to it, 2.75%. If I compare those two numbers, I have a default spread for Brazil of 1.5%. This is in November of 2013. I'll give you an update right now so you can see how much has changed in the two and a half years since I did this analysis. So in November of 2013, the default spread. But to do this, you need either a dollar denominated bond, so you can compare to the US T bond rate, or a euro denominated bond, which you can compare to what? The German euro bond rate to come up with a default spread. So that's a first approach. And until about 10 years ago, it was the only way you could get default spreads for countries. Here's the second. About 10 to 11 years ago, a market opened up called the Sovereign CDS market. You're saying, what the heck is that? It's a market where you can go buy insurance against default risk. So let's say you bought a Brazilian dollar denominated bond today. Right now the rate's about 5.5% or 6% or maybe even 7%. Rate looks good, right? But you're worried, what if they default? You can go to the CDS market and buy insurance against that default. It'll cost you. What will it cost you? Each year, it's going to cost you about 5.5% of whatever you make. Because right, right now, that is the sovereign CDS spread in the market. So if you collect 7%, I'm going to take 5.5% of that. But in return, I'm insuring you against default. The sovereign CDS market is a traded market. I can observe what default spreads do every minute of every day. You're saying, why do you need to look at it every minute of every day? There's a coup in a country. You know how long it takes rating agencies to even realize something's happened? Six months later, the news hits them. Oh my God, there was a coup. <laughs> then they get a committee together to reassess the rating. A year and a half later, they say, guys, you're in trouble in that country. And you say, I know. It's all gone already. You tell me now. It took them three years after Greece got into trouble to start lowering the ratings for Greece. It's not that they're corrupt. It's that they're slow. They'll get there eventually, but too late for you and I to do the adjustment. The nice thing about having a market-based number is you get instantaneous reaction. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, the Russian CDS spread went up immediately. When Egypt had its, uh, its problems in 2010, 2011, the CDS spread went up immediately. It reflects what's going on around you. So if you want to live in the world you're in, not the world you wished you were in, I think it makes sense to look up the sovereign CDS spread. In November of 2013, that number was 2.5%. You're saying, but it's different from the first approach. It is. It's two different markets. We'll talk about what to do once you get different numbers, but you get a different judgment. But you're saying, what if I have a country that does not have a dollar-denominated bond and does not have a sovereign CDS spread? There's a third choice. If you have a sovereign rating, it's slow, they're, they're late to the, but let's say you told me that the rating for your country is BAA2, BAA1, CAAA, whatever. I have a lookup table that I update at the start of every year. This lookup table is computed based on countries for which I can find a CDS rating or a default spread. I do a pivot table in Excel. So basically, I can see what the typical spread is for a AAA, AA, BBB. You give me your rating. I'll go to that lookup table and say, based on your rating, this is what your spread should be. And that, in November of 2013, was 2%. With Brazil, I have three judgments I can make about the default spread. It can be 1.5, 2.5, or 2. Now, part of your risk-averse side is saying, just add the three numbers, divide by 3. If that's the way you deal with uncertainty, I'm OK with that. Okay. But whatever you do, stay consistent with that number. You're saying, what do you mean? We're going to come back. I'm going to ask you this number later on in the process. Whatever number you use at this stage in the process is the number I want you to feed me later in the process when I say, what's the default spread for Brazil? So that's where I get that 2.25% default spread is by one of these three processes. You know what these numbers look like today? I actually made a copy of the FT. It's so blurry, I can't even read what the numbers look like. It's what happens when you need reading glasses. But even with reading glasses, if any of you can read the Brazil number, the fourth from the last column, do it. I think it says 5.51%. It's a fourth column from the left. It says bid yield for Brazil. That's a dollar-denominated yield right now. It's 5.51% for about a seven-year Brazilian dollar denominated bond. Okay. I think it does. So don't, don't take me in my word. If you actually can get your hands on the FT, you, it'll actually be clear in the paper. 
Unfortunately, when I did the PDF, it seems they've created this version of the PDF that just blurs as you explode it up. Okay? So let's see, what do you, you think, what do, what do I do with that? If the dollar denominated bond rate right now is 5.53%, remember the UST bond rate for a seven year bond is about 1.2%, not the 10 year, but the seven year. 5.5 minus 1.2 gives me a default spread of 4.3%, which is more than almost three times higher than it was November of 2013. The CDS spread for Brazil right now is five and a quarter percent. I sent you actually that PDF file last week with all the CDS spread, 63 countries. So it's, that's, almost, that, that's almost tripled as well. And then, or it's more than double. And finally, if you look at the rating, the rating is still pretty much stuck where it was. It's one notch lower than it was. So the rating based spread remains low, but all the other spreads have exploded. Why? If you've been tracking what's happening in Brazil, the answer is pretty obvious, so we don't have to dig too deep. But country risk can change. And that's a reminder to you that you can't stay stuck with what you see in November of 2013. So when you look at your company, don't take my November 2013 numbers. Those are not the numbers you should be looking at. It should be the numbers as of right now. So here's what I did. I took every emerging market currency, and I did what I did for India and Brazil. I just took out the default spread. So see this gray part of this graph? Those are my risk-free rates in different currencies ranging from the Taiwanese dollar to the Brazilian RIAI. In November of 2013, the Brazilian RIAI risk-free rate was close to 10%. It was the highest risk-free rate across currencies. That was in November of 2013. So with each, each one, what I've done is I've taken the government bond rate, the purple part of the line is the default spread. I've taken out the default spread to end up with the risk-free rate in each currency. We do an update on this. I've kind of been able to add to my currency, so now you have some currencies that you didn't have before. So you have the South African Rand. Um, so basically, you can go down the list, and you can have the, the highest risk-free rates on the right, the lowest risk-free rates on the left. That's what we're going to ask. Because basically, you're, going to, you're asking the same question I'm going to ask you next, which is if these are all default free, how come the rates are different in Swiss francs versus US dollars versus euros versus Australian dollars all the way to Russian rubles? Why do risk free rates vary across currencies? We kind of answered this question, but if you can answer this question, you crack what I call the currency code. You can deal with any currency at any time because you kind of understand why currencies give you different rates. You want to try, why do you think rates are different in different currencies after you've adjusted for risk? Obviously, the answer can't be that Brazil is risky, the US is not. What is it that causes risk-free rates to vary across currencies? That's a risk answer, right? So if I've taken that out already, then that shouldn't be the reason. There's only one reason. Inflation. That's it. The only reason currencies matter is different. You can have different default free currencies with different inflation rates. And that's why I said you cracked the currency code. Because if you pick a high inflation currency, you're going to get a high risk free rate and a high hurdle rate, right? You're saying that's awful. But if you pick a high inflation currency, your cash flow should be higher, your return should also be higher. What one hand gives you, the other hand will take away. That's good news because what I'm saying is you can't take a bad project and make it good by switching currencies. And you shouldn't be able to. You can't take a good project and make it bad by switching currencies. You shouldn't be able to. A project should be either good or bad. Currencies are just a measurement mechanism. And I used the temperature analogy before, and I'll give you the temperature analogy again. You're stuck in Dubai in Ju on June 15th of 2016. And you measure the temperature in Fahrenheit. So it's a really hot day. You re-measure it in centigrade. Guess what? It's still going to be a really hot day even though the number gets smaller. So you cannot be taking projects and changing them around by using a different measurement device. And that's all currencies do, is they bring different numbers to the process. There's one other thing that I want to draw your attention to right now, is driving people insane. It's driving economists insane, analysts insane. Notice that to the very left-hand side, what do you notice about the risk-free rates in Swiss francs? They're negative. That's, it's almost, it, it, the reason it's so difficult to get your head around that concept is think of the way we were taught interest rates, right? 
Go back to Econ 101. I know you've tried to forget that class, but think about that class again. The way I was taught interest rates is to get people to lend money, you've got to give them a return, right? Because they're giving up current consumption for future consumption. So borrowers pay money to lenders to get them to defer future consumption. If I add inflation to the process, it gets even worse. So a nominal interest rate has a real interest rate. That's that preference for current consumption and an expected inflation rate in there. So when you, as you lower the rate, you're saying lenders are charging less and less. You're OK with it. Maybe they don't care that much about current consumption. Maybe inflation is low. You get to 0.1, then 0.05, then you get to 0, and then you keep going. And the reason it's so mind-boggling is what am I now saying? If you're a borrower and I'm a lender, I'm in a zero, I'm in a negative interest rate environment. Okay? When you borrow money from me, what happens? I pay you. Think about that. You borrow money from you and I pay you. You borrow money to buy a house and every month you get a check in the mail saying, good job. <laughs> That's the mind-boggling part about negative interest rates. But the reason it's mind-boggling is you say, why would I ever put my money in a bank earn a negative rate, right? Because what's your alternative? Just take the cash, stuff it under your bed. The only problem is if you have a million dollars in cash, your bed is going to get higher and higher off the ground. And if people around you in the neighborhood know you have a lot of cash under your bed, then you're going to be probably dead in your bed sooner rather than later, and your cash is all going to disappear. This is one of the byproducts of us switching from a cash economy. We're all dependent on cards. We're willing for the convenience to leave our money in the bank, even if it means paying the bank 0.1%. There's a point where even we will stop, right? If it's a minus 3% rate or a minus 5%. So this is a very dangerous game central banks are playing. It's insanity. It's insanity because they've been trying this for six years and it hasn't worked. Trying what? Lowering rates. To do what? To get the economy going. It's not working. It's like a lever stuck in full throttle. They're pushing it and pushing it. Sooner or later, it's going to break off in their hand. And then what are we going to do? But if you have a currency, so if you're working with Swiss francs, I think the Danish krona is, is the other currency right now where you have long-term rates which are negative. It's OK. It's OK. Just let it go. Leave that as your risk-free rate. It's all going to work out. Trust me on this one. It sounds like a crazy thing to do. But start off with that as your base and keep building. Because somewhere else in your analysis, that negative rate is going to come back and hurt you in your analysis. So for the moment, don't view negative risk-free rates as somehow an aberration. They're just an extension of low rates. Just let it go. Okay? Any questions on risk-free rates? Yeah. The Japanese bonds are strange. Because the Japanese, we talked about insanity lasting for six years. In Japan, it's been lasting for 26 years. Because it started in the early 90s after the Nikkei collapsed. The central bank started lowering rates. So we've had that long term, la and you know how much the Japanese economy has exploded over the last 25 years, right? I'm being sarcastic. It hasn't worked in Japan for 26 years. And last week, the Japanese bank said it hasn't worked for 26 years. So guess what we're going to try to do? More of the same. And then the next day, there's a headline in the Wall Street Journal saying Japanese central bankers puzzled by market reaction. No, oh, central bankers must live on an island or hang out in Davos or someplace in Switzerland. You know? It's almost like they've lost connection to reality, or they think they control the entire economy, when all they control is interbank borrowing rates. So what's happening in Japan partly is that the rates have been low for a really long time, and Japan has lost its AAA rating. So basically, you've got the default spread on a really low rate. And that's pushing the rates down. So the Japanese long-term rate is just turned negative, but the Japanese, the Swiss, and the Danish rates, long-term rates, are all negative. So if you're working in those currencies, it's OK. You can have a negative starting point and keep building on it. Yeah? What does it mean when the default spread is zero? Can we compute from this on it? The default spread is zero. You just have a sovereign which is AAA rated. That's all it is, right? The way I'm doing it, that's all I've done. So if it's a AAA rate, it's if it's US, if it's Australia, if it's Canada, you're going to see a default spread of zero. There's nothing more than I needed it as a mechanical device to get to risk-free rate. Those are my easy currencies. Yes? In one of our first sessions, you referred to the carry trade, or short trade arbitrage is one of the biggest scams in finance. And I'm curious, even accounting for yeah. uh, the default spread, and okay. like, why does 
Did, did, for, did everybody get the question? Remember that I talked about the carry trade? The essence of the carry trade is if, if I gave you this graph, does it look like there's an easy way for you to make money? Go borrow money at, in Swiss francs and invest it in Brazilian rias. That should make you a lot of money, right? Because you're borrowing at close to zero, you're investing at 11. Instead of purchasing power parity, which is the other shoe waiting to drop, what do we say the difference between rates was because of difference in inflation, right? So you got a high inflation rate, 11% inflation rate in Brazil, and a 0% inflation rate, or worse, deflation in Switzerland. If you're purchasing power parity, what's going to happen to the nominal REI over the next year? It's going to depreciate by roughly 11%. So you thought you were making 11% spread, but at the end of the year, when you collect your money and you convert it all into one currency, guess what? It's going to wash out. The reason it looks like you make money doesn't happen. That adjustment doesn't happen every year. So you can go for a decade with the inflation adjustment not happening at change rates. You make money, you make money, you make money, you make money, then you lose it all. Because you get a big devaluation at one go. Which is essentially what happened in Brazil. For 10 years, I did purchasing power parity for the RIA, and people in Brazil laughed at me, saying, David, what are you doing? The RIA strengthens, every and it did. For 10 years, even though inflation in Brazil was, was higher, the RIA kept strengthening each year. And of course, in the last two years, it's almost like the top blew off, and you go from 2.2 RIAs to 4.5 RIAs. So the carry trade looks like it makes money for a long period before it blows up in your face. And the reason it doesn't make any money is you're bringing nothing to the table. This is a brainless trade, and it deserves a returnless end. And that's where it, it takes a long time for it to catch up with you. So when you see a hedge fund blowing up because of a carry trade, your response should be, thank God, what took so long. Because there's really nothing holding that hedge fund up other than pure optics of it looking like you're making money. So any other questions on risk credits? Yeah. You don't have to. There's a little bit of a mismatch I'm using. I'm using a spread from a dollar-based market. And that's true for even for the CDS market. It's a dollar-based market on a local currency, risk-free rate. And we'll come back and talk about it. If that bothers you, there's a way around it. We'll talk about how to do it. But you're not restricted to do everything in dollars. It just means you have to wait till later in the process to convert your, exchange, your discount rates into REIs or pesos. You don't do it right at the start. In other words, you work with dollar risk-free rates and you do the whole analysis. Then last stage, I'll give you a way of going from dollar-based discount rates to REI, peso, whatever currency you're in. But it is, a, it is in fact, a little bit of a mismatch. Okay. Yes? Um, you mentioned that defense was due to inflation. Mm -hmm. Currency exchange rates are, you know what causes exchange rates to vary? Even if you have no default risk, exchange rates are going to be volatile. Why? Because inflation is not a constant, right? If inflation is variable, even though you have expected inflation be the driver of differences, if the differences in inflation vary widely across time, you're going to get differences in exchange rates. It's not a risk measure, it's just a fact that inflation each year gets re-estimated. Okay? So that's, a, it, that's going to happen even if you have no default risk. The exchange rates are going to vary, vary unless you have constant inflation in every country, which you don't. Okay? So exchange rate variation is not a risk measure per se that's in the risk-free rate. Later in the process, you can say, if I'm investing in a foreign currency, should I be demanding a premium for that risk? That's a different question. Okay? At this stage, it's not an issue. So now let's move on to the next part. So we've got a risk-free rate. Let's move on to the equity risk premium. Let me set the table. The equity risk premium is what you would demand over and above the risk free rate for investing in equities as a class. It sounds abstract, but let me make it concrete. What do we say the risk free rate in US dollars is right now? About 1.7, 1.75%. Let's keep that as a base. Here's what the equity risk premium is how much more than 1.75% would I need to offer you for you to invest in equities, stocks? You're saying, what's going to drive that? Well, it's going to be driven by two things. One is it's going to be driven by how risk averse you are as an individual. And second, it's going to be driven by how risky you think equities are as an investment. Hold on to that thought. Because you know, if you think about that second question, if 
fast, how risky are equities as a class, the answer you might give me today might be very different from the answer you might have given me even at the start of the year. So it's a shifting number, but those are the two things that drive it. So let's focus first on that risk aversion factor. What causes different people to have different risk aversions? First, let's start off with very broad categorizations. Older people versus younger people, who's more risk averse? Older people, why? No, for any number of different reasons. Which actually raises an interesting implication. If your equity risk premium, if your risk aversion increases as people get older, markets with older investors should have higher risk premiums than markets with younger investors, right? It's a problem that Japan and Western Europe have in spades because both, con both regions of the world are aging. So even if you see nothing else change, you should see risk premiums in those markets start to get higher. Second, and this is a touchy one, men versus women. Who's more risk averse? I heard women and I heard a few men being whispered in really low tones. <laughs> it actually is very interesting. Young men are less risk averse than young women. A fact that I can attest to with three boys and a girl. All of them scarily. My youngest just is getting his driver's license this week. I'm not getting in the car with him. The only one of my four kids I'll get into the car with is my daughter. The rest, I mean, they drive like that crazy. Young men are more risk averse than young women. But as you age, I think the break even point is around 35 to 40, risk aversion start to coincide, except on small bets, where men remain less risk averse than women. Small bets like what? That football game you bet $10 on. As a man, it's a no-brainer. As a woman, you work out the probabilities. You call it an actuary. You work out the numbers. No, I'm not betting. To we so it's, it's just different. But young men are more. And that actually raises an interesting point. If you walk into any trading room anywhere in the world, have you been in a trading room, right? Not the polite intellectual trading room, but the real trading room. You walk and you look around. What part, I mean, what portion of the human population is over, you know, to, if you look at the proportion of people who are, who are traders in the trading room? Lots of young males. It's the nature of trading. And if you think about the, in terms of risk aversion, the worst possible group to be asking to take risk, what is it? Young males. Then we wonder why we get $6 billion trading losses. Three years ago, just in, only partly in jest, I suggested, very, it was right after the society, it was uh, Jerome Kerbiel had you know, his big trading scandal, $6 billion loss. So on my blog, I suggest a very simple fix for this. I said, here's what bankers need to do. When you hire a trader, hire his mother to sit behind him. <laughs> Mothers are natural risk blocks. I mean, you would never have made it to be a 25-year-old male if you did not have a mother saying, what are you doing? Don't do that. Okay. You'd have to pay the mother maybe 100000 or 150000 as compensation, but she'd be looking over the trade. Do you can't do that. That's too big a risk. Think of the money you'd save on that next big trading scandal. So it depends on how old you are, male or female. But part of this is you're born with it. You can't fight it. Okay. Let me go back to my four kids again because I can use them as my lab experiments. I can tell you which ones are going to be invested in bonds for the rest of their lives and which ones are going to be the option traders. My oldest, who's 26, still comes down the stairs holding on to the banister. I might fall now, I might fall now, right now, maybe now. A bond trader, if you ever thought one, right? My youngest, when he was two, took off from the top stair expecting to be caught before he hit the bottom. There's your option trader, something good will happen. Why should I worry about it now, right? Okay. So some of this you cannot fight. You are born either very risk averse or low risk averse, but it varies. So let's do a little experiment. Let's see how risk averse this room is. Okay? So I'm going to give you a choice because this is going to tell me a little bit about your risk aversion. So let's assume you have some savings. It has to be an assumption right now because MBA programs suck up your savings. So let's say that you actually have some savings. And let's say those savings are invested right now, risklessly earning 3%. All of your money. So you're sitting down for dinner, you get a call. It's a cold call. 
I've quit my job. I'm now a salesperson from the Vanguard 500 index fund, the S&P 500 stock. And I've heard that you have all your money invested risklessly earning 3%. I'm going to make you an offer you cannot refuse. Say, would you like to shift your money into stocks? You're making 3% guaranteed. So the question I'm asking you is about how much would I need to offer you as an expected return, not a guaranteed return, obviously stocks are a guarantee, before you make the switch. So there is no, there's actually one wrong answer that I hope you don't pick. <laughs> but, but there is no right answer beyond that wrong answer. So let's go through the list of potential answers. So you're making 3% guaranteed. How many would settle for less than 3%? This is my ultimate test. If three quarters of you had put up your hands, I'd have said, you know what, guys? You're beyond redemption. <laughs> Let's skip the rest of the class, go home, right? So thank God nobody picked that. So from this point on, everything's OK. Three to five. Expected return. Nobody? Five to seven. Least risk-averse people in the room or most risk-averse people in the room? Least risk averse people in the room. This is what least risk averse people do. They switch into stocks faster than everybody else. They'll have more of their money invested in stocks for the rest of their lives. That's okay. There's nothing good or bad. That's the nature of risk aversion. Seven to nine. Looks like the middle of the distribution. Nine to 11. More than 11. You know what? When you do this, it's actually unusual to have only one person more than 11. You get about 15. And 14 of them usually are from emerging markets. And there's a reason, because your risk aversion comes from where you grew up and what you saw around you in chaos. So you can already see that even though this is a, this is a pretty homogeneous group in what sense, you're about the same age, or roughly the same stage in your lives. But look at how different risk aversion was in this room. And if this were the entire market, you know what my equity risk premium would be? It would be a weighted average. Of e because each of you gave me a risk premium, and you said five to seven, you're saying your risk premium is between two and four percent. Seven to nine is four to six percent. So I could take each of your numbers and take a weighted average. Saying weighted by what? Not by how much enthusiasm you showed and you put up your hand. It's weighted by how much money you have. Let me be brutally honest with you. If you have no money, I don't care what your equity risk premium is. You can whisper it to me, you can yell it at me, I don't care. You have $40 billion, I'm listening really carefully. What Warren Buffett thinks about the equity risk premium right now matters more than what everybody in this room, this building, perhaps the entire neighborhood, thinks about the equity risk premium, because that's what $40 billion brings to the table. So this with the entire market, I could take an average risk premium by doing a survey of every investor. You see the practical problem of doing this, though? How many people invest in the US equity market? 55 million, 60 million, 80 million. Can you imagine sending out a blanket email to them? Spam mail. What's your equity risk premium? How much money do you have? <laughs> I'll wager 80 million people respond right away. But let's say they did. I don't know how. I put something into the email that they cannot resist. You know what my second problem is going to be? Each of you gave me a risk premium, right? What if I told you in the first hour and 45 minutes of trading today, the market dropped 20%. Don't worry, nothing bad's happened, so don't freak out. But let's assume that that had actually happened. While you were sitting, the market dropped 20%. Then I asked you the same question I asked you just three minutes ago. You got your money at 3% guaranteed. How much would I need to offer you to get you to switch? Given that additional little fact that I threw in, markets down 15% or 20%, do you think your risk premiums might be different now? How many of you demand a larger premium now for investing in stocks? And why? Because you got a reminder of this is what risk is. Sometimes risk is an abstraction until it hits you in the face or in your gut. How many of you demand a smaller premium now? And the answer, the reason would be? Because if stocks were good at 17,000, they should be even better at 13,000, right? And that is the essence of contrarian investing. A very alluring strategy on paper, but perhaps the most difficult strategy to put through in practice. And here's what I mean. Try buying stocks in the middle of a sell-off. Your hands will be frozen. Get to the keyboard. No, I can't do it. 
It's easy intellectually to say, I'm going to buy when everybody else is selling, but and history suggests that it's a pretty good strategy, being a contrarian. But psychologically, we're hardwired not to do it. Why? Because through, I mean, through as long as man, mankind's been on Earth, that's when you panic, you run with the crowd. You don't run against the crowd. But my point is, equity risk premiums are not fixed numbers. They will shift as the world changes around you. So I'm going to give you the three ways in which people have tried to estimate equity risk premiums, and maybe give you the pluses and minuses of each. The first is to do something very similar to what I just did. Ask you what your risk premium is. Survey investors, obviously not all tens of millions of investors, maybe a subset of them. I'll show you what the numbers look like from these surveys and why nobody uses survey premiums. The second is to look backwards. You say, what do you mean look backwards? What's the question I asked you? How much more than 1.75% would I need to offer you for invest in stocks, right? Maybe I can tell you what people have made historically. You, said, you might say, I don't care, but I could tell you over the last 60 years, people have made 4% more, 5% more. That's called a historical premium. You'll see why people are drawn to it and what can go wrong with that. And the third approach is to reflect the fact that risk premiums change. It's a forward-looking premium where I try to back out from what you do what your equity risk premium is. So let's start with the first one. Let's think about surveys. As I said, you can't survey all investors. So people survey subsets of investors. And here are some of the subsets that have been surveyed. Securities Industries Association, which is a trade group, used to survey individual investors. And here's what they used to ask. What do you think stocks will do over the next year? Very simple question. What, do you, what kind of return do you think stocks will make over the next year? So let's say you were all individual investors and you collectively came back and said 10%. Know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the 10%, subtract out the 1.7%, and say, based on what you've told me, your equity risk premium is 8.3%. They stopped doing these surveys in 2004 because they decided it was pointless. It was pointless because what they were getting were not expectations, but hopes. Know what I mean by hopes? So what do you think stocks will do? I need them to make at least 25%. Otherwise, I'm going to go bankrupt. Therefore, the answer is 25%. So they said, this is useless. Let's stop it. So that stopped in 2004. Merrill Lynch every month from its London office does a survey of global portfolio managers. Why? Because they control a lot of money. And they ask them, what do you think stocks will do over the next year? They take that number and they subtract out the risk-free rate, hopefully in the right currency, they come up with a risk premium. That number has been around 5% pretty much for the last six years. Very sticky number. Then they ask CFOs, Campbell Harvey and John Graham, who teach at Duke, they are CFOs of companies. What do you use as a risk premium? Very different group, right? Because these people use risk premiums to come up with hurdle rates inside companies. And that they do once a year. The most recent update they got was about 5.5%. And Pablo Fernandez, who teaches in Spain, asks, I think, 8,000-something analysts. He goes with big numbers, 103 countries, 8,500 analysts. What do you use as a risk premium? Their number for 2011 was 5%. That number has crept up to about 5.75% now. And then Pablo, and perhaps the most useless survey of all, asks academics what they use as an equity risk premium. The reason it's useless is what did I say your risk premium is weighted by? How much money you have. Right? So why waste your time asking academics? But I guess we have a disproportionate weight in this process because we spew out numbers, which then gets used by other people. And that premium was about five point. It was pretty close to the analyst premium. As I said, nobody uses these premiums. They're sticky. They're backward looking. They're not expectations in any sense. The only market where I, which I know of, where survey premiums were used to come up with hurdle rates was the real estate market. For a long time, I don't know whether they still do it. Cushman and Wakefield, which is a New York-based real estate firm, used to publish this four-page or six-page brochure where, by region of the country and by type of property. They reported what developers were demanding as a rate of return for investing in that property. So Florida residential, 8.1%. Okay. So these are survey premiums. Nobody uses them. But at least you're aware. So when you see a survey premium, this is what they're talking about. Let's move on to historical premiums, because this is what 90% of investment bankers, consultants, and corporations use. So here's what I'll do. And I'll go through the process of coming up with a historical premium. But then I'm going to ask you, and in two, the question of what I'm assuming when I, when I use this as my forward-looking premium. I go back and I look at a slice of history. Last 20 years, last 50, last 75. I ask two questions. What would I have made investing in stocks 
over this period on an annual basis, what would I have made investing in T-bonds or T-bills on an annual basis over the same period? Let me make up some numbers. Over the last 50 years, let's assume stocks have made 8% a year. T-bonds have made 2% a year. 8 minus 2 is 6. That's a story. So it's not rocket science. But before I show you the numbers, let me ask you a question. When I use this, what am I assuming about the future? That look like the past. This is called mean reversion. U.S. analysts in particular are extraordinarily lazy in doing this because for 60 years they were okay doing this. You assume that everything always goes back to the way it used to be. I stopped even touching historical risk premiums in 2008. And if you have to ask me what happened in 2008, then I think you need to go back and read some financial history. Because to me, 2008 was a dividing line. I said, never again are we going to return to the world of 1965 and 1975, where the US was half the global economy and everything reverted back to the way it used to be. But that's what you're assuming when you use a historical premium. You think, I'm OK with that. I'll give you a second problem. You ask me what the historical risk premium is for the US. I could give you 12 different numbers. You're saying based on what? It depends on the slice of history you look at. If I go all the way back to 1928, I get a very different premium than if I go back to 1965 or to 2005. Very different premiums, 10 years, 50 years, 85 years. It depends on whether I look at T-bonds or T-bills. Remember the difference. T-bonds are the 10-year bonds. T-bills are three or six months short-term rates. So the premium is different depending on whether I look at T-bonds or T-bills. And it also is going to be different depending on how I compute my average. That sounds strange. You think there's only one way to compute an average? To get an average over 85 years, I can add the 85 numbers and divide by 85. That's a simple average, an arithmetic average. Or remember that you get compounding and returns. In other words, if I go up 10% and come down 10%, I'm not back to where I started, so I can compute a compounded average. So it depends on how far back in time I go, T-bills or T-bonds, how I compute my average. Do you see how incredibly convenient it is to have this table if you're an analyst? I've given you a license to do whatever you want and get away with it. That's why when somebody says, I use a historical risk premium, don't let them get away with it. Because if you do, they can use whatever number they want. So I'm going to cut to the chase. If you're going to use a, a historical premium, I'm going to put you on the spot. First, if you're going to use a historical premium, I'm going to argue that you need to use the longest time period you can get, not the shortest one. Let me explain why. Remember STAT 101? When you make an estimate of a number based on data, what do you try to put in brackets below that estimate to tell the world how uncertain you are about your own estimate? A standard error, right? Practice we very conveniently forget when we leave that STAT 101 class. If I told you the historical risk premium for the US over the last 88 years is 4.54%, second decimal point nailed down. Impressive, right? Before you get too impressed, see this 2.29%? That's the standard error in my estimate. Let me try this out and think like a statistics class. The equity risk premium over the last 88 years in the US is about 4.5%. Oh, by the way, the standard error in that number is 2.3%. What have I told you? Very little. The true premium could be zero. It could be 9%. That's with 88 years of history. What if I told you the historical risk premium is 2.53%? Why? Because I want to use more recent numbers. The standard error in that number is 8.66%. I might as well have told you absolutely nothing. 10-year averages, 20-year averages, 25-year averages, 50-year averages. In the stock market, they're like noise. There's really not enough data. You have to go back. Even though it might make you uncomfortable going back to 1928, that's before the Great Depression. So I, if you force me to pick a historical risk premium, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back as far as I can. I'm going to stay consistent about what I call risk-free. And I said I, in corporate finance, we're going to use the long-term rate, not the short-term rate. So I'm going to look at the T-bond rate. And I'm going to use a geometric average. Why? Because this number is going to compound in my hurdle rate. It's going to be a compounded average. That's what a geometric average is. So if you had to pick a number here, and you force me to pick a historical premium, the premium that I would pick right now is 4.54%. But here's the problem. That was at the end of December of 2015, right? 
What's that number going to look like at the end of January of 2016? It's got 86 years of data kind of dragging along. It's not going to change much. You could be in the middle of a calamity. And the historical research says, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It's nice to take some value. But this is beyond, you know, this is not just smoothing out your mood. This is, you know, basically making it seem like nothing is happening. But that's a cost of historical risk premiums. Numbers just stay frozen. Any questions on historical risk premiums? Okay. Now let's talk about what to do with other markets. Because what do we say we need to get a historical premium? 80 years of data, 85 years of data. I have three companies in my sample where I'm going to have some issues. One is Baidu, which is the Chinese market. The second is Stata Motors, which is the Indian market. And the third is Vale, which is the Brazilian market. In none of those markets am I going to have more than 15 to 20 years of reliable data. The Indian market's been around a long time, but wasn't very deep till about the 1990s. 20 years of data. What do we just say about 20 years of data? It's not going to give you a risk premium. So you have two choices. An Indian company or a Chinese company comes to you for some advice on hurdle rates. You can tell them to come back in 60 years. So I'll have enough historical data then, and I can tell you what to do. I would strongly recommend that you not say that or you try to do something today. So I'm going to take you through my personal journey of trying to estimate equity risk premiums for these markets. Remember when I asked you to estimate default spreads for countries, I said, hold on to, to this because I'm going to come back and make you use that number again? Here's the first way to get an equity risk premium for another market. Start with the US, with the, with the US equity risk premium and act like you're pretty comfortable with it. So let's say you take that historical data. In November of 2013, that historical risk premium for the US was 4.2%. That's a number that's been updated to 4.54 now, it was 4.2%. So let's say I feel pretty comfortable about that. I want an equity risk premium for India. Here's what I do. I take the 4.2% and add to that the 2.25%. Does that look familiar? That's a number I took out of the government bond to get a risk-free rate. I now added back my risk premium for India is 6.45%. The 0.8% that I had for China, I added back to 4.2% to get an equity risk premium for China. The default spread for Brazil in November of 2013 was 2%. I added on to the 4.2%. I've got an equity risk premium for Brazil. I'm using the default spread as my proxy for the additional risk in a country. So the riskier a country is from a rating perspective, the larger its equity risk premium is. This is the state of the art, if you can call it that, in how investment banks compute equity risk premiums for emerging market countries. They added the false spread. It can be a CDS market, it can be from a dollar denominated bond to the US equity risk premium. They've got the risk premium for that market. So 20 years ago when I started seeing this practice, I understood what people were doing. They wanted a risk for a country and this default spread was a convenient measure of risk. But here's the one thing that I was puzzled about. What's this default spread capturing? The risk in investing in a government bond issued by that country, right? But what are you investing in? You're not thinking of investing in bonds, you're thinking of investing in stocks. So intuitively, what should you expect the risk premium for Indian equities to be relative to investing in the Indian government bond? Higher or lower? I would expect it to be higher. And I struggled with this for a while, and I'm still struggling with this. Here's the way I've decided to adjust the default spread for the fact that equities are riskier than bonds. I look up two numbers. I look up the standard deviation in an equity index in that country. So in the case of Brazil, it will be the Bovespa. In the case of India, it will be the Sensex. In the case of China, it might be the Shenzhen. I look up the standard deviation in the equity index. Then I look up the standard deviation in the, India, the government bond in that country. So as an example, if you take India, the default spread, the, I'm sorry, the standard deviation in the government bond was 17%. The standard deviation in the Sensex was 24%. For Brazil, the standard deviation in the, in, the, in the Brazilian government bond was 14%, in the Bovespa was 21%. So I'm looking up two numbers. And then I set up an algebra problem. I said, look, if I bought the government bond with a 14% standard deviation, the spread I'm demanding is 2%. If I'm buying stocks which are one and a half times more risky, why? Because 21 divided by 14 gives me 1.5, I should be demanding a 3% additional. So I call this a country risk premium. It's what I'm adding on top of my US equity risk premium to come up with the risk premium for that country. It's a two-step process. Start with the default spread, scale it up, 
add it on to my base premium. It's only as good as my base. So you can say, what, you know, what if you don't trust the base? But that base allows me to come up with a risk premium for a country. So as long as I can get a default spread for your country and scale it up, I get an additional risk premium added on to the US premium of a risk premium for every country for which I have a default spread. Now let me go, yeah, go ahead. Some of the same common things, right? So if you're looking at Russia, for instance, when Russia invades Ukraine, the government bond obviously becomes more volatile. But stock prices also, it's the same fundamentals driving both. But because you're the last guy in line as the equity guy, you can look at the same fundamental and feel more worried than the guy ahead of you because you get whatever cash flows are left over. So it's the same fundamentals flowing through. You just feel more risk because you collect cash flows after the bondholders do. Yes? Just a standard, I use a two-year standard deviation. You can look it up on Bloomberg. Because they're both, they're, you know, Bovespa, for instance, you go to Bloomberg, you can take off two years. You might not even have to go to Bloomberg. You can go to Yahoo Finance and download two years of Bovespa prices and come up with the standard deviation. Well, I use, I also compute this across all emerging markets, and I come up with a ratio where if you give me Zimbabwe, I'm not going to be crazy enough to try to look up the standard deviation of the Zimbabwean equity market. That number this February, in February of 2016 is 1.39, which means your default spread gets scaled up by that number. But I want to revisit the 4.2%, which came from a historical premium. I've, in a sense, started digging a grave for historical premiums, right? Backward looking, noisy. I want a forward looking number that's less noisy. So I'm going to set up a process for estimating a forward looking equity risk premium. And I'm going to use the US market to illustrate how this is done. If you've taken foundations or you're taking foundations, I'm sure you've already seen how to compute the yield to maturity on a bond. So somebody remind me what the process is for computing the yield to maturity on a bond. I'm going to tell Bill this. And then he's going to make you come back, and he's going to charge each of you $50. And then he's going to make you retake your foundations exam. Come on, let's not go that way. So how do you compute the yield to maturity for a, for a bond? What's the process? You look like you know, so tell me. Um, so you start with the price, exactly. <laughs> then what do you do? Coupons, and then the face value. And, <laughs> and then, last step, you're almost there. Then you look for that discount rate that makes the, exactly, right? <laughs> See? So basically, you got the price, you got the coupons and the face value. You look for that discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows equal to the price of the bond. You got the yield to maturity. It's an internal rate of return for the bond, right? I stole that concept and tried to apply it to stocks. Let me explain. On, on November 1st of 2013, which is when I was doing this process, I went and looked up the S&P 500. Can you buy the entire S&P 500? Yeah, today you can buy the spiders, you can buy an index fund. So when you buy the S&P 500 instead of a bond, you bought the 500 largest market cap stocks in the US, right? So I know what you paid, 1756.54. What are the cash flows you hope to get from this investment? Not coupons, but dividends, and maybe stock buybacks, because the US companies do that. Unfortunately, unlike a bond, I can't tell you what they will be in the future, but I can tell you what they were in the 12 months leading into November 1st. of So I can tell you what they were last year. You're saying, that was last year, You're right. So I look up a final number. The S&P 500 is the most tracked and followed index in the world by far. And there are people whose job it is to forecast earnings growth for the entire index. At the start of November of 2013, that growth rate was 5.59%. See where I'm going to go next? I took the 82.35 from the last 12 months. I grew it at 5.59%. I got my cash flows for the next five years. And now I run into a third problem. With a bond, I had a finite maturity date. I could just wrap things up and get the face value back. With stocks, these cash flows are going to keep going and going and going forever. And I can't estimate growth rates forever. I don't even have a growth rate forever. So here's what I used as my proxy for the growth rate beyond year five. And this is something I'm going to come back to over and over again. I use my risk-free rate as my proxy for the growth rate in perpetuity. Now do you see why if you pick a negative 
risk-free rate, it's not going to help you for very long. You'll have a low discount rate, but then when you do things like growth, I'm going to say, no, 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 you've done things in Swiss francs, your expected growth rate forever is going to be minus 0.2%. So here's what my problem looks like. I know what you paid. I have your cash flows for the next five years. I have your cash flows beyond your five. I solve for the discount rate, just like I did for the bond. It's a little messier. I have to use the solver function in Excel, but the number I came up with in, at the start of November of 2013 was 8.04%. I'm almost home. At the start of November, if you bought US stocks, given what you paid for those stocks, you can expect to make 8.04%. I subtract out the T-bond rate on that day, which is 2.55%. My equity risk premium at the start of November of 2013 was 5.5% or 5.49% if you prefer precision. You see why it's forward looking? Because it's based on future cash flows, it's based on what you pay today. Yeah? Why are you giving the risk-free rate as a, as a What goes into a risk-free rate? Expected inflation plus a expected real interest rate. What goes into the growth rate of an economy? Expected inflation plus an That's why low risk-free rates are not good news, because what is it giving you, telling you about the economy? It stinks. Negative risk-free rates are even worse. It really, really, really stinks. And you can't have that really, really stinks as your basis for your discount rate. And forget about the really, really stinks when you do your cash flows and your growth rate. So when one stinks, the other stinks too. It kind of balances out. Yep. You could. You could. It'll all even out, right? Because then you'll have a higher discount rate at the end, a higher growth rate. It offsets. As long as both the risk-free rate and the growth rate are moving together, it doesn't matter. So why create one more estimation challenge for yourself? If you, I mean, if you ask an economy, what do you think T-bond rates are going to be five years from now? You're going to get an answer. It's going to be always wrong. It's going to be wrong for every one of us because it's almost impossible to forecast rates. Okay? For the last four years, every time I've gone in front of the CFA for their keynote, I ask them, what do you think rates will be one year from now? Every single year, you know what the answer is? Oh, they're going to go up. Why? Because they look low. Next year you come back, they're lower still. What do you think? Oh, they're going to go back up. So I think in a sense we can do that, but as long as both change, you're okay. So this is an implied equity risk premium. So start of November, here's the challenge I faced. I had to use a number for the US as my equity risk premium. I had two choices. I could go with the historical data which said use 4.2%. Or I could go with the implied premium which gave me 5.5%. One is backward looking, the other is forward looking. The standard error in the 4.2% was 2.29%. The standard error in my 5.5% implied premium is 0.2%. This seems to me like it's a no-brainer. Maybe it's just me. I don't see why people hang on to historical premiums. They're backward-looking and they're noisy when you're forward-looking numbers. And you can, we can disagree what, the, what growth rate to use you know, for the next five years beyond. I'll wager our numbers are going to be within 0.2 or 0.3% of each other. Historical premiums, on the other hand, you can get any set of numbers. And I'm going to use that 5.5% as my base instead of the 42 And I'm going to do everything I did before with emerging markets, which is look up the default spread and scale it up. So to get my equity risk premiums, here's the three-step process. I'm going to start off, and I'm going to give you the November 2013, and I'll give you the update as of today. I'm going to start with my implied premium as my base premium for the U.S. Why is the S&P 500? That's my U.S. premium. I'm going to look up the, def the rating for your country. If your country is AAA rated, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say you're a mature market too. And if the equity risk premium for the U.S. is 5.5%, your equity risk premium also has to be 5.5%. Why? Because you have two mature markets with different equity risk premiums. What's going to happen? Money is going to leave the lower premium market, go to the higher premium market. So any AAA rated country, you're going to see 5.5%. If you're not AAA rated, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up with a default spread for your country. And I gave you the three ways of getting that default spread. And then I'm going to scale it up for the risk of equities in your country using that ratio of standard deviation of stocks to standard deviation of bond. I'm going to come up with an equity risk premium for your country. So you want to see what the world looked like to me in November of 2013? There it is. Okay? So let's, see, let's start off. US, 5.5%. Where did that come from? That was my implied premium at the start of November of 2013. 
Why is Canada 5.5%? Because it's a AAA rated country. Australia is 5.5%, Singapore is 5.5%, Germany is 5.5%. So every country which has a AAA rating has a zero country risk premium, the US premium. If you don't have a AAA rating, pick Latin America. There isn't a single AAA rated country in Latin America. But you take Chile, Chile's equity risk premium is only 1.2%. Why is it so low? Because Chile's rating is A3, which is a high rating, low default spread, low country risk premium. So this gives me the picture of the world. You're saying, why do you need this? You have only six companies in six countries. Why did you have to go to the rest of the world? There's a very simple reason. Where's Disney Incorporated in the US, right? It's a US company. So I can just use the US risk premium. Can I? See, the question I'm asking, if you're a US company, can I get away just attaching the US equity risk premium to you? That's what most people do. I don't think it makes sense, and here's why. Disney, for instance, gets 82% of its revenues from the US. It gets 18% from the rest of the world, Europe, Asia, Pacific, Latin America. To get my equity risk premium for Disney, here's what I had to do. I had to take a weighted average of the equity risk premiums by region. You're saying, why didn't you do it by country? Disney didn't break it down by country. They broke it down by region. If you go to the previous page, I actually have regional averages. These regional averages are actually the average equity risk premium for that region weighted by the GDP of each country. Why? Because if I take Asia and I weight Vietnam and China the same, I'm doing a disservice to Asia. So basically, it's a weighted average. What you see here is my weighted average equity risk premium for that region. That weighted average of 5.76% is my equity risk premium for Disney. Now, I need the world to do basically any multi, which is what? 90% of country, companies that you're going to be running into will have revenues outside their domestic markets. You take Ambev, big Brazilian beverage company. It has revenues all over Latin America and in Canada. You have to bring it into your equity risk premium. You take Coca-Cola. Atlanta-based, but get 60% of its revenues outside the US, you have to bring it into your equity risk premium. You say, why are you using revenues? What are your choices? You can use revenues, maybe EBITDA, maybe EBIT. You know why I, don't, why I use revenues? The less chance accountants have to touch a number, the more you can trust it. And I, I'm being cynical, but if you look at earnings by region, Magically, the regions that have the lowest tax rate seem to make the most money. I don't know how that happens, but if you trust EBITDA or EBIT, you'll see that if I kick in. So I go with revenues because A, it's available for almost every company, B, because accountants haven't messed with it, and C, because it's always positive. Why does it matter? I need weights. If I get a negative EBITDA, what do I do with it? So that's my equity risk premium for Disney. Here's the rest of the world. And as you go through these companies, you're going to notice a very, very scary phenomenon. Develop. First, let's start easy. The equity risk premium for Bookscape, which is a New York-based bookstore, thank God, is just the US premium. Unless, of course, they run this niche bookstore that sells only to Chinese tourists. Let's hope that's not the case. Okay. Vale, where is? When you say think about Bali, it's a Brazilian company, right? But what, what country is it most exposed to? 37% of its revenues come from China. So this is a China problem for Vale. Tata Motors, Indian company. In 2013, the biggest market was India. The second biggest market by a hair was China. In fact, in 2015, China was 35% of Tata Motors revenues. Now do you see why the answer to any question you ever get asked in an interview just has to be China? Just say China. Most of the time, you're going to be OK. Why are rates going up? China. Why is this company in trouble? China. Why are you having a stomachache? China. I mean, it's, it's amazing how China, because, and that's why when China melts down, it's not just China that's affected. It's all these companies that over the last decade have made themselves partially Chinese companies. Big portions, right? Baidu, of course, is all China all the time. 
Deutsche doesn't actually break it down very well, but that's what the world looked like based on, and they would give this trading stuff, you know, it's very, it, oh, banks are incredibly opaque. You have no idea what they're exposed to, because they could be trading Chinese bonds from Europe and show it as European trading, for all you know, okay? But my point is, when you look at companies, this is why you need the risk premiums by country. Until November, uh, until 2008, I used to compute the equity risk premium for the U.S. at the start of every year and use it through the whole year. You know what my defense was? The U.S. is a mature market. The price of risk cannot change that much during the course of a year. So what's the harm in doing it in 2007 and using it through 2007? You know why I'm showing you this graph? Because what's, what's the point I mean? How much can risk, price of risk change during the course of a year, right? In 2008, I found out. This is actually the implied equity risk premium for the S&P 500. See this green line? For the S&P 500, by day, from September 12th to, through December 31st of 2008. Saying, what's so special about September 12th of 2008? It was actually a Friday. I was on my way home at 4 o'clock. Why was I on my way home at 4 o'clock? I just wanted to get home. Um, I just didn't feel like staying around. I, the news story that was passing that I was listening to said that Lehman was in a bit of trouble and that Barclays was looking at ways to acquire Lehman. And I'll be quite honest, I heard the story and I said this is really bad news for Lehman employees, but it's, you know, it's not market risk, it's some firm specific risk. And I came into my office on September 15th to a very different world. That was of course the start of the 2008 crisis. So by day, every day I tortured myself as I came into work by estimating what the equity risk premium was at the start of each day. You're saying, how much can it change in a day? If you were trading or working in that period, you knew how much it could change in a day because the market would move 1,000 points during the course of one day. So it started off at 4.37%. There was a day in November. This is two months later. where the equity risk premium in the U.S. was almost 8%. It almost doubled in two months. You know what that taught me? Never again would I sit on an equity risk premium at the start of the year over the whole year. I had to do it more frequently. So starting in September of 2008, I've been computing the equity risk premium for the S&P 500 at the start of every month. At the start of February 2016, that number was 6.47%. It's the highest it's been in the last six years. So if you want to see the equity risk premium, you can, either, you can download the spreadsheet and do it yourself. It's not rocket science, it's a little Excel spreadsheet. If you're too lazy to do that, you can go to the front page of my web, website and it should be the equity risk premium for the most recent month. If you're too lazy to even do that, you've got to thank my daughter for this last one. So about four years ago, I'm sitting around at home doing, minding my own business, which is what I usually do, in my little corner of a little corner of a room that's mine. And she busts into the room. She never waltzes in, walks in, busts in. She says, Dad, do you have a Twitter account? I said, Kendra, I don't. She said, Dad, you're so old. And then she walks out. Pisses me off, no end. Why you'd state the obvious and then walk out, I don't know. But it's how difficult can it be to open it? So I go in and open a Twitter account. I forget all about it. Six months later, she busts into my room again. She says, Dad, do you know you have a thousand followers on Twitter? I said, what? I've never Twitter tweeted nothing. What are they following? Go on, thousand people. So I said, if they're following me, I have to give them something to follow. The start of every month, guess what, what I tweet out? The equity risk premium for the S&P 500 just hit six point. This is like a Kanye West tweet. It gets carried through millions of, huh? 6.47 percent. Okay? So join the ranks. As I said, my objective is, was to be the Lady Gaga of finance, but now I have a lesser objective. I just don't want to beat this Kanye West guy, okay? who really tweets obscene things and not the, most of the stuff has to be blanked out. No, I, I send out the equity risk premium at the start of every month. Okay? So join in if you're not a Twitter follower, I'd need the numbers. Okay? So I will see you on Wednesday. Huge. Even the stocks are not traded. It's still a big economy. No, they might they might not be correlated at all. That's exactly why you want to go to the size of the economy. Because when you look at companies, 
and you look at their operations, they don't go into countries based on which country has the largest market cap, they go into countries based on which one is the largest economy, the largest market. Because these weighted numbers are what I'm going to use if you as a company report to me that you get 30% of your revenues from Asia. As a company, I sell stuff. So the money comes from the government. They're printing off money. They, they still buy iPads and iPhones. and I, it, it doesn't matter. To me. So because it's where I sell my stuff, and that's driven by GDP and how much money people have to invest. So whether it's private business or public companies, governments or private businesses, it really doesn't matter. I'm going to go to wherever. So this is really what I use as a vehicle when you give me a regional revenue is I have to make my best judgments of how is that revenue being spread out across the region and you're never looking at market caps to ask which country should I go into. You're looking at population sizes, potential you know consumption power, what people will buy. So it doesn't really matter where the where the money's coming from. Another question is about He's missing a point. You don't borrow a lend as a company at negative rates. You borrow neg the rate plus the default spread. And guess what? The default spreads widened by more than the rates got dropped. Japanese corporate bond rates increased after the lower rate because, in a sense, you're sending signals about risk premium. So you hold default spreads constant. Lowering rates actually makes corporate bond rates go lower. And you can talk about corporate bond cycles and repay. It's not uh, corporate corporations don't borrow lend money at the risk free rate. They borrow at the risk free rate plus a default spread, and that default spread comes from investor expectations about the future. So when a central bank goes and does something to lower rates, it's sending signals about the economy to the rest of the market, and they reassess things like equity risk screens and default spreads. If you look between the middle of last year and, the, and now, interest rates are all risk free rates are all down in every currency. Corporate bond rates are higher.